It starts with a suspect on the run and usually ends with a felon in custody. But in between is all the real life danger, drama, and split second decision making that's the hallmark of the high speed chase. And since on average, 61% of vacationers travel by car, the chance of getting caught up in a pursuit is higher than you might think. In the next hour, we'll take you on the inside of these dangerous police pursuits. Reveal the latest airborne technologies used to smoke out the bad guys. Did you think I was going away? Where did you think you were gonna go? And we'll go behind closed doors to see how police are learning to combat potentially deadly pursuits. Put your hands up! Join us as we reveal how the cops spike them, block them, and bump them. Next, on Secrets of Police Pursuits. of roadways in the United States, all designed to handle the nearly 150 million vehicles that routinely cruise their paths. And nearly 80% of drivers view their automobiles as the safest way to take a trip. But the truth is, whether on a simple Sunday drive or sitting in the gridlock of rush hour, one very real danger remains the same. At any time, on any roadway across America, you could get caught in the middle of a high-speed police pursuit. Sure, it's a big country. So it could never happen to you, right? Well, with as many as a quarter of a million police pursuits a year in America. No! Oh, oh no! Oh, no! Oh, no! This is terrible. The secret is, the odds aren't as remote as you might think. He's flying up Western, unbelievable. In those pursuits, one in three ends in a crash with more than 55,000 people killed or injured. And one quarter of all pursuit deaths are to innocent bystanders. There is a silver lining in all of this. On average, authorities apprehend suspects in nearly 75% of all police pursuits. But for law enforcement agencies, true success won't come until 100% of all police pursuit suspects are apprehended without incident. And now they gang tackle him. And the secret to that is to foster emerging technologies. Uh, we're going to know. Step up training methods. Clear. And ensure that the public safety is priority number one. But no matter how good the training, officers need to be prepared for anything. Especially since statistically, the majority of pursuit suspects are driving while under the influence of alcohol. Atlanta, Georgia's largest city, draws some 17 million visitors a year. It is a gleaming example of Southern hospitality. 
home of the 1996 Olympic Games. It is also the birthplace of Martin Luther King and Gone with the Wind author Margaret Mitchell. But at the height of rush hour in July 2000, a drama of a different kind unfolds as police pursue a suspected drunk driver. A young lady had said that her boyfriend had been drinking for a week. I pulled my car in front of him in order to box him in. He did stop. I got out of my car, went back to his truck, and he took off again in my direction. The driver swerves recklessly through the gridlock traffic, even as the tread on his tires begins to shred away. He had absolutely no regard for anybody's safety, including his own. Drive down the road, side of the road, he got on the 316, got to speeds around uh, 80 miles an hour. We could see him in the truck. He was busy in there. He was, he was moving around. He was ducking down. He was getting back up. Uh, he was drinking beer. Officers attempt a boxing maneuver with their patrol cars to slow the suspect down. DUI task force officer Mike Feltovic was part of that maneuver. He was driving like a madman. We had just started to try our boxing in technique, and so then I could see that uh, he was weaving at the police cars also, and it seemed to be getting more and more dangerous at that point. The fleeing suspect escapes the officer's attempt to contain him, and the chase takes a potentially deadly turn. Radio, he's 41. I'm going to stop and stay with the vehicle. Sir, you okay? Though his car is totaled, the victim escapes with minor injuries. But up ahead, our driver's drunk luck finally runs out when his car dies. The police take action. They rush the driver and target a weak spot in his arm to subdue and cuff him. Finally, this drunken rampage is at a sobering end. He put everybody's life in jeopardy that day. We passed hundreds of cars. Each one of those was an opportunity for you to hurt or kill somebody. And you still got caught. We know that officers do everything possible to ensure public safety. But what you may not know is that it's often the officers themselves that face the highest risks. Since one of the earliest recorded police chases in 1922, more than 140 police officers have been severely injured or killed while engaging in high-speed pursuits. March 1993, Santa Ana, California. Police respond to an emergency 911 home invasion call in progress. The investigation turns into a police pursuit when a fleeing suspect begins firing wildly, severely wounding an officer. Desperate, the armed fugitive hijacks a pickup truck, taking its driver hostage. Having wounded one officer already, the suspect begins firing at the pursuing officers. Veteran cop Bill Barrett was one of the officers directly in the line of fire. I've never been really in a situation like that. And I slouched down and swerved to the number one lane, tried to avoid being shot. 
Finally, it appears that the carjacker's wild ride is about to come to a screeching halt. But the suspect is not giving up. Still armed and dangerous, he takes off on foot. He's out and running westbound. He's out running westbound onto the major street. White T-shirt, white hat. Levi just got the gun in his right hand. Sergeant Paul Gonzalez arrives on the scene and attempts to cut off the fleeing suspect. I had exited my vehicle. I came up to this location. And I started to get about here. And I heard the helicopter say, he's coming your way. He's coming your way. So I immediately started to back up. As I got to about my car door, here, with my gun drawn, I could see him break the plane, and we looked eye to eye. He pointed his gun at me, and he fired. Right there, there he is, that's him. He's shooting, stand by. I was in this position. I took my first two shots at him. And as he got closer to the corner of the house at the building, I fired my second two rounds. And they hit the back of his feet on the ground again. The suspect jumps a fence looking for a route of escape. But like his freedom, this foot chase is about to come to an end. In a pursuit spanning four counties and lasting nearly an hour and a half, the suspect is finally arrested. He was later charged with attempted murder, evading arrest, and reckless driving, and is now serving a 60-year sentence at California's Pelican Bay Prison. Next on Secrets of Police Pursuits, it's a little-known fact that of the tens of thousands of police pursuits that happen each year, nearly 60% of them happen at night. This poses a unique set of problems to the police. Mainly, you can't chase what you can't see. But a select few departments across America have found the answer. A secret high-tech weapon that's way above the rest. Literally. San Diego, California is a cosmopolitan city of almost three million souls. Known for its pleasant climate, gorgeous coastline, and quaint seaside establishments. And it is also home to the latest in high-flying helicopter pursuit technology. This two million dollar bird can travel more than a hundred miles per hour speedy enough to keep up with even the most souped-up getaway car. It boasts a 30 million candle power light called Night Sun that can illuminate an area the size of a football field or be focused with laser beam accuracy on a fleeing felon, all while transmitting real-time video from a gyro-stabilized high-powered video camera to officers on the ground below. But what do you do when the crooks try to hide where the light can't find them? Like under thick brush or in a tunnel? Well, now there's a secret weapon. San Diego police simply click on the FLIR. At nighttime, we would switch to the FLIR, or forward-looking infrared. And that camera system detects heat. Got suspect in the shed. Got suspect in the shed. We use it virtually 100% of the time on our radio calls at night. That's how we operate. Our job in the air support unit is to see and to provide information to officers on the ground. At night, we can't do that without the FLIR system. That's just the bottom line. It operates just like your home video camera, but it doesn't see colors and visible light. It sees heat. And when the picture is displayed to us, it looks like a black and white television screen. Levi's and a ball cap. He is still running northbound in the alley right now. So even in pitch darkness, under brush, or in a darkened alley, it doesn't matter. FLIR still picks up the heat from a vehicle or body. In other words, when FLIR's flying, you can run, but you can't hide. Police car right there, that's him right in front of you. It's 10 foot. San Diego, August 6th, 1999. 
A fleeing suspect turns off his lights, hoping to elude officers under the cloak of darkness. 10-4, southbound 805, the number three line. But little do the criminals below know that the chopper above carries Fleer. You have blocked out southbound 15. Guys, southbound 15. Turn up on the path. Turn up on the path. Turn up on we were using the infrared system and we were able to see the car's heat, so it was fairly simple to stay up with them. As well as warn officers on the street of any trouble down the road. Fine, you've got no cross traffic at that intersection. He's coming up on El Cajon. Watch it, officer. There is cross, cross traffic here. Step for just one stop sign and there is no cross. Sensing that they can't escape by car, the suspects decide to abandon their auto and make a break for freedom on foot. But Fleer is not fooled. Uh, one block north of University. Passengers bailing out. Drivers bailing out. We're staying with the driver. Driver is running southbound on the west on the east curb line. Uh, now he's running eastbound towards the alley. Eastbound towards the alley. High above, the officers easily track the suspect's position. Lincoln on Polk on Ohio. Right up to the Abel, it's a Hispanic male with a white shirt. Levi's and a ball cap. He is still running northbound in the alley right now. For a white shirt. For Lincoln on Polk on Ohio. Right up the unit right now. That police car right there, that's him right in front of you. It's 10 foot. Due to the secret weapon of Fleer, both suspects are arrested. Fleer is so sensitive that it can pick up even the slightest heat source. So in a pursuit, any heat is suspect until proven otherwise. As discovered in another San Diego chase involving an auto theft suspect, who on foot plunges into the underbrush along a freeway to evade officers. Police on the ground lose sight of him, but Fleer above picks up a suspicious speck of heat. Okay, guys, I may have your target here. Hang on just a minute. Everybody hold your position. I got something in the bushes I'm checking on. Okay, Fadina, sir, hold your position. Okay, it's an animal, guys. It's an animal. Disregard. It turned out to be a cat hiding under the brush. Well, real quickly, we opened up our perimeter, started searching again, found another heat source, uh, and didn't know what it was, but directed officers to that heat source. Okay, uh, I got something in the brush here on the south side of the bridge. Okay, there's an officer walking along the freeway. You are 10 feet from the thing I'm looking at. They literally got to within about four feet of the heat source and could not see him. And we told him, hey, he's right there. Right off in front of you, right there. And they looked down, and finally they pulled him out of the bushes, and it was the suspect. Taking the suspect into custody. Yeah, we're taking the suspect into custody now. Clearly, the high-tech ability of Fleer to put the heat on fleeing felons is simply too cool to pass up when it comes to a pursuit. It's 10 While a few places actually report a slight decrease in police pursuits due to new technologies and training methods, the statistics are still frightening. Every day in the U.S., a high-speed pursuit claims at least one life. In 1997 alone, 255 of those lives lost were innocent pedestrians or drivers. Another 114 innocents were killed in 1998. 139 more injuries in 2001. The fact is that despite progress, law enforcement agencies are faced with an ongoing epidemic of dangerous high-speed police pursuits. The controls, there's cross traffic up ahead. Most frustrating of all is that no matter how capable the officer, it's virtually impossible to know when or where a suspect will decide to flee. Unless, of course, you live in Los Angeles, California, the police pursuit capital of the world. Oh my God. Oh my God. Los Angeles is known the world over as the home of Hollywood. Beverly Hills, Rodeo Drive, classic California beaches, and the capital of fancy cars, clubs, and shishi hotels. 
But one of the city's best kept secrets is that in the City of Angels, you can pretty much count on a daily dose of high speed pursuits. As many as 1,000 per year. This guy's out of control. And he goes, oh! LA's urban landscape is bisected with 22,000 miles of surface streets and freeways, driven daily by nearly 5 million commuters. Los Angeles County also handles the most visitor traffic in the entire state of California. Nearly 50 million people each year. Fertile ground for the high-speed pursuit. Look at that. Oh, they take him out. They took him out. But with such a vast expanse of land to cover, LA presents a unique challenge to the police doing the pursuing. Oh, look at that. Oh, no. Oh, no. Los Angeles is its own environment. They, they are aggressive. They chase a lot. Their mentality is basically, if we don't chase, everyone's going to run. I think it's important to point out that the suspect is the one who initiates the pursuit by failing to take appropriate action. So we become involved in the pursuit when the suspect has clearly exhibited a desire to avoid arrest. But what you may not know is that it's up to the individual officer to decide whether or not to pursue. And when they do, they often face major dilemmas during the chase. May 10th, 2002. LA police follow a suspect in a white Jeep Cherokee, believed to be armed and dangerous. got a lot of traffic up ahead here. He's going to have to go to the wrong side of the road. And that's what he does. Wrong side of the road, northbound Wilson. Oh, hard on the bridge. As the suspect weaves wildly through the traffic, the police must decide how to handle the situation. Stay back and run the risk of losing the suspect and the possibility of injury to the public. Or engage the individual and risk the lives of officers themselves. They're going to try and box him in. And he almost hits head on. Flying up Western, unbelievable. And there's a crowded intersection up ahead here. The suspect makes an attempted escape along LA's exclusive Mulholland Drive. Look at that, oh, he loses control there. Hits the guardrail, continues, now drives across the street, and the car overturns. The car overturned, suspect, it's on fire now, and the suspect is trapped inside. The car officer is now coming up. They don't know if he's armed or not. They're gonna try and get him out of that car before it completely burns. They pull the suspect out. He hit almost head on. The suspect is injured, but alive. And the officer's decision to follow closely, but not too closely, was the secret to preventing the suspect from hurting others in his frantic attempt to flee. Cops see more than their fair share of erratic escapees on the highways of L.A. And felony evaders will do just about anything to escape the long arm of the law. For some suspects on the run, one vehicle just isn't enough. And often, innocent bystanders can become the unwitting pawns of a pursuit. Okay, now we come to that, uh, that intersection approaching Clark. Los Angeles, February 10th, 1998. A pickup leads officers on a dangerous chase. At times, the suspect drives at speeds of more than 100 miles per hour. There's cross traffic ahead. There's a red light coming up here. He is out of control. He, he just has no regard here. This could end right here. Even as sparks cascade from the truck's metal rims, the driver races on until he plows his truck into the back of an airport van. Getting out of the vehicle, out of the vehicle. He got into that van. He just got into that van. It looks like he's carjacking another vehicle here. He was wanted for carjacking. And uh, the vehicle's going. Now this is now a hostage situation. They're stopping. The vehicle is stopping at this time. The, the person is trying to get out. Oh, no, he's being dragged. That guy was being dragged. He's no longer driving. But even as the suspect attempts a getaway in his new ride, Officers know it's just a matter of time before his luck runs out. 
Okay, now we've got uh, four. Oh, the vehicle's out of control. Hits the center divider. Hits the center divider. And this is going to come to an end right here. Suspect getting out. This is very dangerous. He's running across the, the lanes. of He's going across the center divider. And the officers are right behind him. He runs across the lanes of traffic. And uh, miraculously, this comes to an end. Uh, without so with events like these happening on the streets of LA, how can officers prepare themselves? The secret, of course, is in the training. In fact, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department has taken the lead in pursuit training. In Pomona, California, at the Emergency Vehicle Operations Center, or EBOC as it's called, officers are put through their paces, testing their ability to make split-second decisions while engaged in a high-speed pursuit. Well, this particular course that, that we're here at right now is an in-service course that's oriented toward the emergency aspects of the driving. In an emergency driving situation, um, there's going to be all kinds of hazards. We try to put them into situations to make them think about, I have a vehicle in front of me. Is it going to hear me? Do I need to uh, wait and allow that person to be able to hear my siren? Sometimes there's a temptation for people to be a little eager, and we want them to experience the consequences. We try to drill very heavily into their mind. Out there in the real world, you're going to have to drive well within your limitations because there's all kinds of potential hazards that are coming at you from all directions. The EVOC track is also designed to simulate a variety of real-life road conditions. We have some multi-lane areas to simulate what might be like on a freeway. And we have a, what we call a city street complex. It's similar to a residential area where there'd be a lot of intersections, streets of varying widths, lengths, and they're going to have to be looking around constantly, looking for hazards. But many real-life dangers of a pursuit can't be recreated on a track. So behind the closed doors of the EVOC facility is where you'll find a secret training weapon, EVOC driving simulators. Inside, the officer is surrounded by video monitors simulating a police cruiser. The computer responds to real-life tactical maneuvers while also presenting obstacles, such as traffic or pedestrians. We have the opportunity with the simulators to put people into more real-like situations with traffic that they really will have to contend with. So what we can do is we can take the behind-the-wheel training and we put the simulation together and have one that emphasizes skills and the other training that emphasizes judgment and decision-making, put them together and you have a total package. EVOC can even network a series of simulators together so that a number of officers can engage in the same pursuit. Suspect has crashed at A and Wall Street, got sufficient due to location for this. By combining high-tech simulators with real-life obstacle training, LA officers have the inside track when it comes to pursuits. With as many as 1,000 chases per year, Los Angeles, California has earned the dubious honor of being known as the police pursuit capital of the world. And he goes, oh, he keeps going. No, he hits the pole, he hits the pole. But here's a little secret. Intensive officer training is helping put an end to high-speed pursuits. But it's not just the training. It's also the toys. New technologies are helping to create crime-fighting gadgets that would make James Bond proud. And one of the coolest gadgets in use today is the remote-controlled tire spike strip, or stop sticks as they are also known. With this system, we can put the spike strip out on the street long before the pursuit gets to our area. This is a definite advantage over the old tire spikes, which had to be precariously tossed out by the officer right in front of the fleeing suspect. But now, with a flick of the wrist and then a flick of a switch, 
the strip sprouts razor-sharp spikes that lodge in the tires, deflating them slowly, bringing the suspect to a safer stop. With yet another flick, the remaining spikes on the strip retract, allowing the police cruisers to safely pass over it and arrest the suspects in the now disabled vehicle. But once the spikes have flattened a suspect's chance of escape, it's time for the cops to actually make the arrest. And when Open dealing with a desperate door. suspect, well, that presents a whole new set of dangers. They don't know what the suspects are going to do. Uh, we have to be concerned with the, the uh, vehicle traffic on the road, uh, pedestrians walking by, uh, the officer's safety, a uh, whole litany of things that are going through their minds. The secret is that a huge part of pursuit training focuses on what happens after the chase has ended. What we simulated today was a, a high risk or a felony stop. Once the vehicle is stopped, the, the officers will remain in their cars, using the doors and the engine blocks for cover in the event of an armed confrontation. Put your hands up! Deputies will ask the driver generally to get out of the vehicle. Step out of the vehicle! And what we're looking for is any indication of weapons on the suspect. Turn away from us! With your right foot, shut the door! Driver, back up to the sound of my voice. Stop. While Los Angeles, California may be the car chase capital, it certainly doesn't have the lock on policy and training. Other states, such as Minnesota and Florida, are taking a tough stance in their efforts to improve the safety of pursuits. In the late 1990s, after a string of tragic deaths in the Twin Cities caused by police pursuits, members of a House committee passed a tough new bill regarding police pursuits and its policies. The bill was sponsored by Minneapolis police captain and Minnesota congressman Rich Stanek, who himself had been previously injured in a police pursuit. Key aspects of the bill were to appropriate funds for technology, including FLIR, but more importantly, to focus on better awareness and training for the officers on the ground. I'm talking about actually getting behind the wheel and engaging in a police pursuit, rolling up the windows, turning on the lights and siren, turning on that radio, thinking about what it is that you're doing in front of you, and using all those factors. Whether it's the roadway, or the uh, time of day, uh, what the offense was that you're pursuing this violator for, taking all those factors into account and not being afraid to say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be pursuing this guy. Maybe I should stop this pursuit. At the Minnesota Highway Safety and Research Center in Minneapolis, officers are trained in everything from cornering to braking techniques. But one of the key secrets to a successful pursuit is to not lose your cool, because that's when you lose control. We actually teach these officers how they can pull themselves down off of an adrenaline kick to maintain the more cognitive part of their brain and the thinking part of their brain. Due to this tough approach on pursuits, Minnesota is starting to get a handle on the problem. The increased training certainly helped bring a safe end to a potentially deadly situation late one April evening in 1999. Uh, Helicopter pilot Officer John Mock is soon flying his FLIR equipped chopper into action. St. Paul police had started the pursuit. They had a uh, bank robbery uh, suspect under surveillance, and uh, when they attempted to arrest him, uh, is when he fled. We advised the pursuing units that we were there, and uh, we used the uh, 30 million. Uh, 
candle power spotlight and shined it down on the vehicle. Seven minutes, copy with the sticks. Okay, you're approaching some more traffic uh, ahead here. Go ahead. Okay, he went to the left lane in the tunnel. He's in the tunnel now. I'm fourth car now. I don't want any of the St. Paul squads following me after we get out of the city. Officers in pursuit refrain from reckless moves that may inflame the situation and maintain a distance while police ahead deploy the tire deflating stop sticks. He hit the sticks. He's throwing sparks from the right side. His car is basically falling apart, and we were told that he could no longer see the vehicle anymore because the smoke and the debris was so heavy coming off this vehicle. So the, the car was basically disintegrating. The officers still hold a safe distance from the suspect, while the helicopter tracks the car from above. Before it blocked in 31 minutes. Yeah, they're just about to the river. Uh, he's going on rims. He hit every spike we had out there. I think he might have popped his motor here. Uh, he's dumping stuff all over the road here that's uh, extremely hot. Long way down, we may be stopping Metro. Door's open, he's gonna, looks like he's gonna bail. Uh, he's out. He's putting his hands on the, on the trunk. He's putting his hands on the trunk. The intensive training and seamless teamwork of officers on the ground and in the air helped end this pursuit safely. While there may never be one definitive pursuit policy, there is a chase maneuver that every department agrees requires intensive training. In fact, this secret maneuver is so dangerous, some departments refuse to use it at all. The pit maneuver is a controversial and dangerous stopping technique that is taught at the Minnesota Training Ground, as well as at other tracks, such as the Griffin Group in Florida. PIT maneuver stands for Pursuit Immobilization Technique, and that's exactly what it means. It is involved in the pursuit, it's designed to immobilize, and there's an awful lot of technique behind it. Mark Snelson is director of training at the Griffin Group in Melbourne, Florida. Here, he and driving instructor Brian Skelly train police in the practical use of the PIT maneuver. Okay, we've got the vehicle sighted. We've got our target position. We pull alongside the pace. Once we've got our pace, we find our target point about 11 inches up to the fender. We ease into the fender. We make contact. And we pit the vehicle. Hang on. Once contact is made, the officer continues to accelerate, forcing the suspect's car into a spin. Then make a U-turn to prevent a felony stop. At this point, come to arrest, do the felony stop. We teach the pit maneuver ranging from 15 miles per hour to around about 35 to 45 mile an hour. The bad guys out there do not drive at 45 mile an hour, thereby it becomes critical that the pit maneuver is executed absolutely and exactly right. If it's not executed correctly, it becomes a ramming maneuver. We have a greater likelihood of damage to vehicles, and we have a greater likelihood of injuries. But there are some instances when the benefits outweigh the risks. The state of Florida is a tourist mecca, famous for its keys, fashionable cities, gorgeous beaches, and even a citrus or two. But it has also seen its share of pursuits. Orlando, Florida, May 1999. A black Ford Explorer is found speeding recklessly through midday traffic. Deputy Richard Colentis first tries to reason with the suspect. The vehicle was stopped behind other traffic and couldn't go anywhere, and I got on my loudspeaker. I explained to him that we had helicopters, that the pursuit was not going to stop. He needed to pull over and let's work this thing out. At that point, he gave me a finger and continued then on to 434. 
with no chance of a peaceful stop, the decision is made to end this chase when the driver heads for a school zone. The vehicle that I was pursuing then crossed the median. I got behind him. As the suspect nears the school, Colentis risks his own life to execute the surprise attack pit maneuver. When the dust settles, the driver has suffered some broken bones, but is alive and in custody. And an innocent driver caught up in the action is shaken, but unhurt. But Deputy Colentis has no regrets about using the ultimate secret pursuit weapon. We were approaching a school, and uh, as bad as I hate that we tore up a few cars, I was not going to let him go through the school zone. Police pursuits. They come in all forms and traveling at all speeds. SUVs, pickups, small cars, even tanks, and soda trucks. They can end uneventfully or take a dark and deadly turn. Oh my God. Oh my God. With events like these, the question is, do the benefits of pursuits outweigh the risks to the public? What you may not know is that statistically, 32% of all pursuits will end in a crash. 15% of pursuits will injure innocent parties, and 1.2% of pursuits will result in a fatality. It's because of these dangers that many departments have imposed much tougher policies on high-speed pursuits. Even LA, that sees a pursuit once every four and a half hours, has debated an all-out ban on most police pursuits. No! Oh, oh no, oh no. James Lassley is a professor of criminology at Cal State Fullerton and a vocal opponent of police pursuits. I've come to the conclusion that high-speed pursuits should be outlawed and they should not be done any longer. And that's my position. 300 people plus are killed each year in high-speed pursuits, okay? This is six times the number of police officers killed in the line of duty. And that's too many. That should not be tolerated. We should not have this type of thing going on. It's an extreme danger to the public. While pursuit-related deaths are indeed tragic, federal legislation has deemed police not liable for the injuries or deaths resulting from a chase. And many officers believe that backing away from pursuits is, in fact, the wrong policy to pursue. It's tried to run over me, pulled out. He's got a gun. The public is not best served to just let suspects flee. If the bad guys know that the cops are going to chase them, they're less likely to run most of the time. The biggest decision that comes to our mind is we have to look at what we're chasing the suspect for. And along with that, we have to look at the risks that we can potentially put the public in. The tires blowed out, he's losing control. There's a constant balancing act. Every 60 seconds, we're reevaluating the need to continue that pursuit or pull out because it's just too unsafe. It's important for the public to understand that pursuit is a necessary tactic that the police have to have, and it's also beneficial for the public to understand the high level of risk. While the debate about pursuits continues, so do situations like the events in Los Angeles, August 30th, 2000. A suspected gang member wanted in connection with an earlier shooting leads police on a chase that spans four major freeways, all while driving on the wrong side of the road. He's westbound, a correction, he's eastbound on the 105 freeway. He's going against traffic, he's in the westbound lane. Oh man, he's up against the number one lane there, yeah, he's up against the center divider, he's driving in that service lane over there. A police helicopter keeps a spotlight on the fleeing suspect. 
On the ground, only one cruiser follows while the others hang back. We're coming to this transition of the, uh, of the 710 freeway now, so we're going to see what he does. Wow, he just missed the bus right there. Uh, again, he's in that service lane, and there's no one broken down in that lane. Or... So we're going to stay on top of this now and see what goes on. So it's a black vehicle. That's about the best we can tell right now. Uh, the police are on the scene now. They're approaching the other, the suspect's vehicle right now. The car that he had the, the collision with first. Now they're going over the suspect's vehicle. Okay, the suspect is moving. He is moving, but look at the condition of that vehicle. It is totally destroyed. Police discover two people in the suspect's car badly injured. But their concern quickly shifts to the innocent family of four, trapped in the crumpled remains of their vehicle. Miraculously, though critically injured, they are also alive. By refining pursuit policy in the future, senseless tragedies can be avoided. But what the police can't protect against is when a member of the public puts themselves at risk voluntarily. Someone in the road right there trying to stop this pursuit. Somebody is. People try to run out and try to stop the suspect or jump in vehicles. We really do not want people doing that. Oh, no, the guy's getting out. Some citizen is getting out of the truck, getting this guy out. Unbelievable. While we're appreciative to people in the community who are trying to help the police, we're very concerned for their safety. We ask that they would leave this stuff to the police. So what exactly should you do if you stumble into a police pursuit? Able 163 southbound under The best thing you can do, stay in your houses, call the police if you see something. If you see the suspect jump out of his or her vehicle and try to run, call the police and just leave the rest of it to the police to handle. So there's the secret. Watch it from your window. Watch it on TV. But leave the chasing to the police. Of course, one thing we can count on is that while the police continue to chase with better, more high-tech methods, they'll probably never run out of criminals reckless enough to think they can still get away from a high-speed police pursuit. Now, everyone stay out there. Able, let's keep the air clear. They're taking them down right now. I'm going to take them down now. Everyone stay out there.